My name is Dr. G. Welcome to That's Unusual, my podcast uncovering the unusual stories behind the world's most interesting people. On this show, we celebrate what makes us different and how we convert those differences into unexpected opportunities. Welcome to another inspiring episode of That's Unusual. One thing is for certain, we will all die. But more importantly, how will you live your life until that day? On episodes 15 and 16, I had a deep and philosophical conversation with Dr. Alex Haddad on how to live a happy and healthy life with no regrets until the day we die. If you haven't listened to those, I recommend you go download those as well and give them a listen as it nicely complements today's episode. What if we were all able to live 50 years longer? How will that impact you? How would you live those extra years? What is the science of driving this? That pipe dream of living longer is closer than you think and is the topic of our discussion on today's episode with Dr. Bob Hariri. Dr. Hariri shares his personal story on how being a pilot, film producer, and neurosurgeon sparked his interest in stem cell research to help solve the mysteries of aging and how to live longer with dignity. We cover a lot of ground, including the breakthrough work he is currently researching as the co-founder of Human Longevity, Inc., alongside his business partners, Dr. Peter Diamandis and Dr. Craig Venter. We discuss everything from moonshots and medicine, to the convergence of cell therapy and genomics, to the realities and implications of what it means to live longer. Dr. Hariri believes we will see this research deployed in our lifetime and shares his thoughts on the hurdles we need to overcome to make this vision a reality. I hope you enjoy this thought-provoking episode as we explore uncharted territory and dream of what's possible. As you listen to this episode, I ask that you reflect on your own unusual stories and unique qualities that can help open doors to unexpected opportunities. And so with that, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to That's Unusual. I have with me here today, uh, Dr. Bob Hariri. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thanks so much, Adam. I am so delighted for you to be on the show. In fact, it was a little bit tricky for you and I getting on this call together, uh, which was scheduled for a little bit earlier in the day. But if I recall our quick conversation, you had actually called me from the cockpit of an airplane that you were flying. Is that correct? <laughs> That's right. As as usual for me, I um, I messed up my timing and was airborne over the over the Atlantic when I knew that I had to get on the uh, on the interview with you. And fortunately, I've got enough uh, comms in my cockpit that I was able to to reach you, and you were gracious enough to <laughs> postpone it a bit. So, well, I'm I'm extremely grateful for the time. And in fact, it probably would have been even more exciting had we had the conversation while you're flying, flying an airplane. But uh, I'm glad we've got your time now. Um, you know, you and I had met, I, I think it was about two years ago, we were both speaking together in Dubai, at one of their digital healthcare future conferences, That's and right. had our first interaction there. But I look at your background. I'm just, you know, I just feel smarter talking to you just having you on the line here. I mean, here we are, you got, you know, neurosurgeon, check, a serial entrepreneur, check, Aviator check, and one of the last lines, which really intrigued me, at the very bottom of your of your bio, you just have a small little thing in there that says, you know, at one point being a film documentary producer check. <laughs> I mean, what have you not done, right? So I look at your bio, and we're going to get into all of the stuff that you're working on right now. But I really want to know, you know, what was in the food that your parents gave you? I mean, can tell me what it was like growing up. Connect the dots for me with all these different things that you've had in your career thus far, and you're not even close to being done. Take a step back. Let's look at little Bob. What was it like growing up, and, and how did you get into the work that you're doing? Well, you know, it, it's, it's a good question. I grew up actually as, a, um, as what we used to call a latchkey kid in Queens, New York, one of two kids of a working mom who was a, a legal secretary in New York City who was working hard to keep the lights on and the rent paid. And one thing that she instilled was 
the sense that if you uh, if you work hard at something, regardless of what it is, you can you can accomplish any objective. Make sure the objectives keep me out of prison. That was her, her <laughs> one, one objective. But you know, I, I've got to tell you, growing up in Queens was was interesting in the sixties and seventies. It was a very diverse neighborhood. A lot of really smart kids. A lot of really tough kids. But at the same time, for for me. Having an interest in things like aviation actually oriented me towards math and science. And, you know, I just found that that was a place where I could feel comfortable and at the same time find lots of different outlets that were were interesting, but also potentially good good breadwinners for me. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, believe it or not, I originally wanted to be a, an airline pilot because I grew up between LaGuardia Airport and JFK Airport. <laughs> I used to sit on the roof of my apartment building and watch the airplanes go back and forth. That's actually where I um, where I actually first started doing something meaningful in engineering and science. And then after spending some time as a pilot, decided that the most exciting and heroic field I was I was seeing was in the field of surgery. Hmm. And I decided that I was going to become a surgeon and I was going to focus on the most dramatic part of surgery, which is trauma surgery. So uh, that's how it all started. So were you flying planes before you became a surgeon? Yeah, I was a I was a pilot before I was a doctor. And was it for a commercial airline or was it part of the uh, the yeah. military or the a little bit of both? Air Force? So, so uh, you know, I was post Vietnam era. So there, you, just when I wanted to go in and become a fighter pilot, all the fighter pilot jobs were gone. So I had to transition from uh, from that to uh, to commercial aviation. You know, I basically I I worked for Pan Am, which was an amazing company back in the in the mm-hmm. late seventies, early eighties. Found out that I had a I had a proficiency towards the science that would be uh, uh, essential to to be a good doctor. So I applied to medical school, got in, and um, was very fortunate. I I went to Cornell in New York. Uh, I hooked up with a lot of brilliant surgeons, and they taught me the ropes. I uh, stayed there as a faculty doc, and while I was there, got very interested in this emerging field of stem cell biology. That's how I found myself where I am today. So what was it? I mean, tell me about that moment when you were a surgeon. I mean, was there was there a particular experience that you encountered that really got you into the field of uh, cell therapy and and, and, and some of the work that you're doing from the business standpoint that you're working on right now? So I was very fortunate. I worked as part of a group in the in the division of neurosurgery at Cornell Medical Center. Um, and I had a partner who he and I focused all of our efforts in the area of trauma neurosurgery, basically mm-hmm. treating head and spinal cord injury. And this was back in the 80s when if you if you were the victim of a traumatic brain injury and you had a loss of consciousness l- that lasted longer than a minute, the odds were you were going to either have a very serious neurologic defect after that, uh, some type of long-term sequelae from that injury, or you were going to die. And we decided that we needed to understand why you can have horrible injuries to your musculoskeletal system, et cetera. But if you get by that original, that initial period, survival was much much less of a problem than it was in head injury. So we decided to spend time, build a laboratory, and investigate what it was about traumatic brain insults that were so lethal. And we basically found out that the problem was relatively simple. It was a plumbing problem. Hmm. You know, the, the brain after injury swells up, but it's encased in a bony skull. And that swelling has no place to go other than to squeeze brain against these immobile structures like the like the skull itself or the or the passage out of the skull called the foramen magnum and that's why people with head injuries who had brain swelling had such poor outcomes well it turns out that if you could if you could sink a drain system into the fluid filled space in the brain the ventricular system and you could manage that pressure these people did much better than before. And so that we turned that into a company. That company was seed capitalized by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, we got a taste of what it was like to build products that wound up in the operating rooms of, of you know thousands of surgeons. And I got my taste of the biotech industry and really, really liked it. And then several years later, when uh, when I was studying the biology of traumatic brain injury and inflammation and so on, stem cells suddenly became a very topical area. And I thought, wow, this might be a tool that could help 
transform the way we treat people with these serious life-threatening diseases, someone's going to have to figure out a way to productize these living cells. I often speak about the epiphany that I had when I realized that that stem cells were likely to be found in the leftovers of full-term healthy pregnancies, Hmm. and that what was normally being thrown away, the placenta after birth, might be nature's stem cell factory. And if I could get my hands on those, and if I could basically deconstruct them, I might find the perfect source of cellular materials for this emerging field. And that was the the inspiration for building a company that went out and investigated the placenta and turned it into a business. So I, I mean, I find that fascinating. You're one of the you're one of the pioneers to basically uncover the potential of stem cells. And and there's a there's a quote that oftentimes goes around with your name associated to it, which says, "Every stem cell thinks it's a fetus." <laughs> Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So so is every stem cell thinks that it's in a fetus? Fetus. And what I mean by that is that we've like actually identified that stem cells reside in pretty much every organ and tissue of our body. And they they reside there from sort of the origins of our individual lives. Early on, as the body is going from a from a human being goes from a single fertilized egg, a single cell, into this complex, you know, multi-trillion cell organism, that process creates structures that are produced from cells which differentiate and specialize so that they can perform the functions of those tissues and those organs. But they leave behind a supply of starting material so that during the course of your lifetime, those organs and tissues continually can be renovated and repaired and renewed over time. And that system is the reason why we are capable of getting a cut on our finger and it can heal to completely normal, normal tissue. The stem cells resident in those tissues get called upon to remodel just the way that it happens in a fetus. So have you ever heard of fetal surgery? Yeah. When I was a young surgeon, and in, in fact, I uh, I had a chance to uh, interact with, with our, one of our former presidential candidates, a guy named Ben Carson, who was a pediatric neurosurgeon, and we were talking about fetal surgery. So that is when you actually open the womb at a couple of months gestational age, and you expose the fetus, and you perform surgery to correct a congenital defect, okay? So in this case, there was a fetus that had evidence of spina bifida, basically a defect in the closure of the neural tube so that the if left unchecked, the spinal cord actually becomes exposed, and these newborns often suffer very, very severe neurologic problems, uh, including paralysis. So with imaging technology improving back in the 80s and so on, surgeons recognized they could identify a child at risk, open the womb, open the uterus while maintaining the fetus in connection to the placenta, repair the spina bifida surgically put the fetus back into the womb and close it up. And then months later, at the end of the full-term pregnancy, when that infant is born, there's no evidence of the surgery or a scar. So, So what's happened is that there is a complete remodeling of the tissue to a perfect, perfect point. And so when I first saw this, I was convinced that if we could harness that remarkable power that's resident in the fetus, we might be able to create scarless surgery, repair the brain after brain trauma, repair the brain after stroke, the heart after heart attacks, etc. And I became fascinated by how to how to reduce that to practice with technology. Now, you've been working on some of that research for the past couple of decades and as part of the research and of course, you know, as part of the the, the company that you had started. We're still at the very early stages in terms of what are the implications and the possibilities of what these stem cells can actually do. If you were to sort of look out into the future, I mean, where do you envision a lot of this great research and capabilities from stem cells? Where do you envision that as actually playing as part of our healthcare system down the road? So, you know, it's a really good question. So 15, 20 years ago, when this stuff was 
hitting the uh, the front page of the news, and it was a very, very topical area in science and technology, everyone sort of looked at stem cells as kind of a miniature organ transplant, that these cells would be used to fill a hole, fill a gap, fill a void in an organ or a tissue after disease or injury. And 15 years later, with all the research that's been done, what we actually realized is that stem cells are part of the natural renovation and regeneration system that keeps us healthy throughout our lives, okay? So, so you know, I often say that stem cells are nature's repair kit. And if you think about how they uh, exert that regenerative activity, they do so by releasing factors, chemical signals, which help drive not only the behavior of their own cells and progeny, but of the cells resident in the tissue that they happen to be in. So for example, we know now that stem cells can repair a spinal cord, for example, without necessarily becoming part of the spinal cord. What they actually do is they help orchestrate the recruitment of endogenous stem cells to effect that repair. And likewise, in other organ systems, we now know that stem cells can elaborate factors which drive the system to a developmental state more consistent with functional repair. And so for me, understanding that complex set of signals and understanding how stem cells can be deployed to provide those signals is perhaps one of the most powerful ways cellular medicine will impact our lives in the future. So repair, so it's just fascinating. Repair and reconstruction to me means looking at looking at something after the problem has occurred and that we can look at stem cells to help us repair something where damage has been done. But then you also talked about fetal surgery, where it's almost like you're preventing it before it even becomes a problem once the baby is born. And, and sort of this dichotomy between, you know, do you feel like stem cells are better suited in terms of intervention, being able to predict and prevent before the problem occurs, or they're better off at repairing once the damage has been done or mutation has been done? So what I think is that if you understand what is behind, for example, the development of a congenital abnormality, or if you if you understand what's driving from the genome the susceptibility to developing a disease like diabetes or whatnot... We are on the threshold of being able to correct that up front by doing things like editing the genome and then giving you back your cells so that those problems don't arise. In terms of the example I gave with fetal surgery, whatever caused the spina bifida, whatever caused the birth defect to make itself present in utero, uh, whether or not we could correct it before it happened, Stem cells, I think, are the most effective way to maximize the functional end result of any therapeutic approach we take, whether it's surgery or whether it's administering a biologic product or whatnot. So the best way to think about this from my point of view is that we are designed to naturally remodel and renovate ourselves throughout our lifetime. And that process yields a functional result that restores the anatomic and physiologic features that are necessary for health and wellness. As we age or as we develop illnesses and diseases, our ability to maintain that anatomy and that physiology consistent with health becomes disrupted. If you have stem cells that can come in and restore that functional regenerative process, you can restore the an anatomic and physiologic function consistent with health. And so without, without being, and I'm, sh- I'm sure I'm, I'm being somewhat confusing, just as in any, any machine or just as in any structure, once you build it, you have to be able to repair it in order for it to survive and, and be sustainable. Mm-hmm. That same process occurs in, in the human body, and stem cells are central to, to maintaining that process. Yeah, makes makes good sense. Now, this is part of the cellular therapeutics company. Is this the company that you're referring to that's uh, part of Celgene now? 
That's right. So, so the company that I that I started and built was called Anthrogenesis. Anthrogenesis was acquired by Celgene back in 2003, and we became the cell, cellular therapeutics division of that company. We built that up to become a leading player in cellular medicine. And right now, I'm in the process of building a global leading business that will take some of the technology from all of the things I've been involved with over the last 20 years and consolidate them into one one major company. You know, it's it's interesting. I often tell people a great disruptive transformational technology takes about a generation to reach its critical mass so that it can change a field. We've seen that pretty much routinely in the in, in medicine and in healthcare. Stem cells have been around for about a generation, and we're just beginning to see stem cells being approved as therapeutic products. We're just beginning to see that there's enough scientific knowledge of how these cells operate, that we're going to be selecting places to use them clinically, and we're just beginning to understand how to produce and supply them so that it fits the current healthcare system we, we operate in today. So I mean, as if as if stem cell uh, therapeutics wasn't uh, enough of a challenge for you, you've now gone on and are now converging a number of different fields, including stem cell therapy, but also genomics. And I think the company you're referring to now, correct me if I'm wrong, is Human Longevity Incorporated, right? HLI. That, that's right. So you know, it's interesting. So everybody knows Craig Venter, my dear friend and partner, and Peter Diamandis from the X Prize. You know, one of the one of the world's leading exponential thinkers. So several years ago, we were sitting around and, you know, over the years, Craig and I have gone back and forth on what are the tools we have at our disposal and how could we use them to to address one of the great challenges in healthcare today, which is maximizing lifespan and maximizing healthy lifespan. And, you know, you've heard it said that longevity is the hottest game in town now in healthcare care because um, the longer and the healthier people can live, uh, the more they can contribute to society and the more they can contribute economically to their communities. And many of the ills we currently experience globally can be addressed by just improved human productivity. And a lot of that happens with a extended lifespan. Well, it turns out that you know Craig Venter is the genius behind uh, looking at our genetic information as our biological software. And he often describes DNA as being the medium through which our programming designed to uh, build every individual cell and every tissue and organ into a, a human being is, is much like a massive software system that resides in the nucleus of the cell and controls all the processes of life. And, and I completely agree with that concept, and I take it a step further that if our biological software resides in the nucleus, then the cell itself is the processor for that software. Yeah. And the cell membrane, which interacts with the environment, is the, the I.O., the input-output uh, system or the keyboard, if you will, and that when you think about it, you can create uh, in your mind an image that every cell is like a miniature computer, and that if we can if we can read the software and ultimately interpret the software, we're going to better understand an individual's likelihood to develop an illness or resist disease. And likewise, if we can control the processor and the quality of the processor, you can produce the output of that software so that it is creates maximum quality for that output. And we're beginning to realize that stem cells are one of the best ways to deliver that intact biological software. And that may in fact be the way stem cells work, is that they help transfer a software system that is uncorrupted and capable of fixing any abnormality or deficiency in the resident software in the individual. So I'm just fascinated by this whole uh, analogy towards this sort of software system and computer analogy. 
Um, to me, it sounds like when Craig Venter, of course, you know, one of the one of the fathers and pioneers around DNA sequencing and genome sequencing from back in 2000, when the the cost of it was roughly a hundred million to to sequence a DNA, to now a thousand, a couple of thousand dollars uh, to sequence a DNA. Yeah. Um, and, and part of the timing, I think, that we've seen with this convergence of you know the the science and and like you said the couple of of decades that we've now seen in terms of the developments of stem cell research combined with our ability to sequence dna at scale at a more affordable cost and also combined with some of the software or sort of gene editing tools that we have available to us i feel like that convergence is essentially uh, really powering our ability to deliver both preventative uh, and and precision medicine into the future. So can you can you tell me a, a bit more in terms of what are you trying to achieve with this? I mean, the, the science is great, the technology behind it, the description. Ultimately, in human terms, if I'm an individual, what does all this mean to me if I can you know be a hundred years old? First of all, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is a unique time where. Things are driving our ability to read our software, interpret it, and maximize its quality. It's at our fingertips. What I think it means for people is that eventually, once you read your genome and you understand what you are programmed to be, what your biology is programmed to be, you can be better informed as to the steps you have to take to maximize the your health and identify things that are risk at risk for you and and either intervene and prevent those things from occurring or seek out some therapeutic modality such as editing the genome or treating yourself with with a cell therapy or some other uh, novel technology in order to circumvent something that might be a cause of premature illness, disease, or death. Uh, you know, many of us know that, uh, I'll give you an example. You know, I come from a family where heart disease has been a, a significant problem, and my parents uh, died very prematurely from heart disease. Underpinning that particular disease are a set of uh, genetic factors which made them susceptible to, for example, the toxic effects of cigarette smoke and made their blood vessels and other parts of their, uh, of their anatomy highly reactive to, uh, to injury so that inflammation was a chronic problem for them. And the net result is you degenerate the quality of your vascular system and you suffer the consequences. Now, Understanding that early enough allows you to take important steps to circumvent those problems. For example, had my mother been aware that she was one of these people who would react so negatively to the toxins in cigarette smoke, and those toxins would basically erode the integrity of her vascular system, she may have taken steps at a time early in life to avoid that exposure. You know, likewise, people think about how just understanding um, how your genome codes for for your nutritional sensitivities would allow us to take steps early and prevent or circumvent disease. And as you said, when we first read, when Craig first sequenced his own genome, the cost was about a hundred million bucks, and it took about a year to do it. We're at the point now where this is around a thousand dollars, and it takes a few hours. And I can assure you that in a couple of years, the cost of doing your whole genome sequence will be no more expensive than a, than a battery of blood tests you get on admission to a hospital. Once th that information is at your fingertips, you'll be able to look at a roadmap, a health roadmap, and understand where the where the dead ends are. Uh, where the potholes are, where all of the uh, the hazards are, so that you can avoid them. Yeah, and I've I've just got uh, it's just it's fascinating what the potential is here, and I've just got got a million questions that sort of racing through through my mind here. It appears that we're sort of at this inflection point of going from you know disease based sick care to more prevention based healthcare. We may be able to solve some of the science in helping us determine 
you know, what we can predict in advance of us actually having a condition and possibly being able to repair it post-condition. But I think a lot of also what's rooted in some of the, the, the lack of progress in healthcare is behavior change, right? So even if I, as an individual, may be inclined to or prone to certain conditions or diseases based on what's been told of me based on my, my genomic sequencing, how do you bridge the gap between what the science is telling me will be wrong with me and how I behave against it to ultimately improve my life? I mean, that's that's one of the biggest challenges we've ever faced in healthcare, right? You're absolutely right. And the truth is that, um, you know, the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? I mean, yeah. you know, sure, we're going to come come to a point where everyone's going to have their genome sequenced. Everyone's going to have the same tool set that will allow them to interpret what that means. And everyone is going to understand that they are in what they ha- what's in store for them if they do certain things, maybe a life of health problems versus a healthy life. And they're going to have to make the conscious decision of selecting the right path. Now, how do you drive people behaviorally to do the right thing? Well, you know, that's the, that's the job of an entire different industry in creating the right incentives so that people take the steps to maximize uh, their health. And, and, you know, clearly, clearly that is an enormous sociological and psychological challenge yeah. that is way above my pay grade. But <laughs> I, I do believe that when people see positive results. Positive feedback and positive reinforcement does wonders for people. The best example is those people who make a life decision to transform their body composition by regular gym attendance and Mm -hmm. exercise, right? People need to see a positive a positive outcome from the investment they make and then generally the psychology drives them to maintain and sustain those changes but you're which, you're which makes sense from a physical appearance standpoint right something that i can see of myself but some of these invisible diseases and conditions that are occurring internally that i can't see or feel like diabetes or heart disease are oftentimes things that uh, you cannot physically see any difference you're absolutely right and so i'll give, I'll give you an example some people who are very subject to the negative consequences of alcohol consumption, they have certain enzyme profiles that make them subject to the toxic effects of alcohol. Knowing that might not be enough to drive them or keep them away from alcohol exposure, right? Because you know what? Nothing better than a cocktail on a Friday night. But the fact is that the industry that we live in, the pharmaceutical therapeutic in, in industry may soon find that there will be products that can be produced to give people who have that genomic profile to make alcohol consumption essentially intolerable. There's a product mm-hmm. that used to be on the market called Antabuse. Yeah. You remember that product? Yeah. Was, yeah. You know, something that prevented the metabolism of ethanol. And so people really felt sick on it. Well, the truth is that there will be tools created to provide clear biological and physical incentives to avoid exposures which are dangerous. But that's one side of the equation. If we stick to the more the more kind of central um, application of genomics, if I know that my child is at risk for certain respiratory illnesses, I may take I may be able to take steps to just change fundamental exposures and to be more alert to things which are triggers for those respiratory changes. You know, things like, you know, exposure to animal dander, etc. There also may be that if a child is uh, more likely to react allergically to certain exposures, that you can take steps up front to desensitize uh, them immunologically against those stimuli. So, you know, listen, this is a this is a, a huge again transformative approach to preventative medicine but i'm fairly confident that as the information becomes more and more confirmed that healthcare will find ways to help drive people towards the right decision making you know i'd like to just shift gears a little bit and really hone in on this 
concept of aging. It's something that's really personal to me because I have a father, I'm sort of the sandwich generation. I have a father who's, who's a former surgeon, um, but now has moderate to severe Alzheimer's. And it's, uh, you know, so of course something, you know, that impactful in someone's life is very hard to predict. And of course, as a caregiver myself and, and witness, and of course, it begs the question of myself is how much am I prone to get it? And it's just a horrible way to live the, the last few of your years of your life. I've had a, a really good friend, I don't know if you know him, Dr. Alex Haddad, who said, and he always says, uh, you know, it's not just important to figure out how do we put more years into our life, but also put more life back into our years that we have. And I think that's extremely important because we've essentially, as a human species, created this idea of polypathology as we get older, right? We're now living with Alzheimer's and heart disease and diabetes and arthritis and all these other, you know, cancer and all these other conditions. And it's a horrible way to essentially age and live the last few years of your life. I'd like for you to, to talk a little bit about what you're doing to essentially address uh, some of those issues about putting more life back into our years as a result of some of your research. And then I'll follow up with some other questions. So that's the holy grail, right? We um, We want to be able to eradicate causes of premature death and compress the amount of time people have to live with these serious and life-limiting diseases. Alzheimer's is a, is a good example, right? I mean, we're beginning to better understand the pathology behind the disease. And you know that there are some genomic traits that are associated with a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, some of those traits are probably linked to people who are susceptible to things like post-concussive syndrome and so on. And understanding your susceptibilities may drive you to take certain steps to, again, to reduce the appearance of symptoms or delay the appearance of symptoms uh, and compress it to, you know, the, the, the later, later part of your life. Now, that's just one kind of immediate way of dealing with the information you might get that would say that you're at risk for Alzheimer's. But the real key is going to be that if you identify, for example, the APOE um, association with Alzheimer's, if you identify that you happen to be, uh, that's a genomic attribute you carry, I do believe that there may be approaches including some of these gene editing approaches, but potentially even cell therapy approaches that help deliver to you some of the genetic traits that uh, that make you more resistant to the disease. So let me let me put this in in, in try and simplify this just for the point of um, illustrating it. I look at Alzheimer's disease as a as a fundamental defect associated with waste management in the brain. Okay, mm -hmm. for an underlying genetic reason, people with Alzheimer's disease are not processing and eliminating the byproducts of metabolic activities, and that leads to an accumulation of toxic materials that disrupt neurologic function. Now, that simplified view suggests that if you could create a stable mixture of cells in the brain that don't have that defect with the cells that do have that defect, you might be able to mitigate the effects in an individual. And so, you know, there, there are many out there who are thinking that if you know early enough, you just edit the genome and help, help encourage repopulation of your body with cells that have the proper genome. That's one approach. The other is to better understand how, how you might be able to deliver a product like a cell therapy that just assists in the waste management problem and helps off, you know, delay or offset those symptoms. So, no, understanding what the genome says about risk factors and susceptibilities is only a tiny piece of the equation. My hope is that the genomic information we gather at, at Human Longevity and, and others working in the field will help us come up with more rational drug design to deal with some of these underlying genomic problems, as well as come up with other strategies, supplemental strategies to help delay or mitigate the symptoms of the disease, not necessarily eliminating completely, but at least getting some controls. So I think it's just fascinating work that you're doing here. I have got, you know, I pulled a quote here from from your friend uh, and my colleague, Dr. Peter Diamandis here, who said, 
and I just want you to react to this one and, and give your thoughts on it. He said, we're going from evolution by natural selection, i.e. Darwinism, to evolution by intelligent direction. Have you heard him say that? Yes. What does he mean by that? Well, you know, Peter is a guy who believes that our fate is completely under our control and that by properly informing oneself and by making oneself providing access to every technological tool, you can help shape and design the future into the future that you want. You know, he often says the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That's another one of his quotes. So I actually think that that's absolutely true. So in the case of those of us who are saying, you know, geez, I, I certainly don't want to be held to that arbitrary life expectancy limit of 80 years of age. I want to be healthy and productive and active until I'm 120. What's the best way to do that? Well, you know, to, in, in Peter's mind, the best way is to assemble the best minds in the fields of genomics and cellular medicine and then help them create companies that develop tools to do exactly what we're trying to do here. Understand the biological software and what it what it predicts for your health in the future. Find ways to fix anything that you discover that subjects you to those risks and build tools that can be used to delay or reverse the changes that lead to the symptoms of dysfunctional degenerative aging. So I'll give you I'll give you an example of some of the things that Peter and I talk about a lot. You know, we're convinced that the three things that are essential for healthy aging is to maintain high performance cognitive function, high performance physical mobility, and believe it or not, high performance uh, physical aesthetics. You know, you have to you have to look and appear youthful in order to be competitive in society. And so it's real easy to find ways to maximize mobility as you age. Mm-hmm. And the best way to do that is to preserve the quality and quantity of your healthy skeletal muscle tissue. And by the way, there are many benefits to doing that. Healthy skeletal muscle tissue is, for example, your body's best way to defend against uh, elevated circulating glucose. Um, Healthy muscle is your body's thermoregulatory system. It's the best way to maintain body temperature. And healthy muscle tissue obviously provides for high-quality mobility. It's a huge detoxifying organ, etc. So we can address those problems by using in some cases, cellular therapy to reverse sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss, or to identify factors that help stimulate your own endogenous population of cells to rebuild and maximize the quality of your muscle tissue. So that's an example of how Peter is helping to drive change, which will maximize lifespan and minimize the degenerative effects of aging. So all of this science that you you spoke of today, you you talked earlier about it takes a generation almost to see these big transformations, you know, become mainstream. Are we going to see this in our lifetime, you think? Absolutely. You know, I got to tell you, the pace... The pace of change is incredibly fast. I mean, just in just in the last 15 years that I've been involved, I have seen tremendous revolution in the way we produce and deploy living cells as therapeutics. You know, when I first started in this field, the best thing we were doing is we were isolating hematopoietic stem cells from bone marrow or peripheral blood, and we were using those stem cells to restore bone marrow function uh, in patients, usually patients who had cancer. Today, we're isolating cells that can be used to, for example, restore synthetic function, collagen synthetic function in skin. People like Joanna Kurtzberg down at Duke is using stem cells derived from umbilical cord blood to correct um, a congenital metabolic abnormality uh, that causes adrenaleukodystrophy. dystrophy. We've been using cells to fix the immunologic abnormalities in inflammatory bowel disease. And we're using cells to create immunologic products that can be engineered to hunt down and kill tumors. So there's a tremendous amount going on. What do you see as the biggest hurdles or challenges? 
Uh, There's a lot of challenges in getting these things to patients because the regulatory system that reviews and approves these products isn't designed necessarily for cellular products. Mm. And so we have to work with the regulatory community to figure out ways to do this. Uh, that's That's a challenge. These are not discrete chemical moieties like traditional pharmaceuticals. And so we're going to have to figure out how to dose them and administer them in a durable, sustainable way. People worry about the economics of things like cellular medicine. I personally don't worry about it because ultimately the scalability and economics will will just improve over time. What about Uh, the ethical privacy concerns? There's no doubt that people have worried that uh, unlocking someone's biological software and making that available, that information available, could potentially handicap an individual. I personally don't believe that to be the case. I actually believe that when deployed broadly so that everybody has at their disposal that information to help guide their health care, it will never be a, be a handicap. In fact, it'll be a significant advantage. You know, the old saying, forewarned is forearmed. I think an individual who better understands what their risk factors are for disease is, is in a much better position to take the steps necessary to avoid problems. And there's, and there's no greater invasion of privacy than having to be hospitalized for an, for an illness. That's so true. So, I mean, this has just been a fascinating conversation. As if all of that stuff that we just talked about isn't enough, uh, what's next on your plate? What's next for Dr. Hariri? <laughs> well, look, I'm very, very focused on building from the pieces that I've created at Cell gene at human longevity at Life Bank and so on. I'm very, very focused on creating a platform, a business platform that puts all of these things together and allows us to maximize the the rate and the pace with which these breakthroughs are utilized in medicine. You know, I'm I'm convinced that for uh, for stem cells to become a meaningful place and have a meaningful place in medicine, we're going to have to reduce them to a deliverable that is scalable, economical, and uses the existing healthcare system uh, to put them to work. You know that's a complicated process, and that that is going to require a critical mass in a company that can have the proper dialogue with the regulatory community with the opinion leaders out there in order to reshape medicine. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it'll go the way of organ transplantation, right? It'll be a tool we know works, but is only deployed in a fraction of the time that it can be. Maybe all of this, uh, all of these developments that you've produced over the years and these great innovations will come back into the form of a, a story documentary on yourself. And I think this is something that we didn't touch on. You at some point got into film and documentary production very briefly. I mean, tell, tell us, you know, where did that fit into this entire story? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good, good question. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you. I'll it's tell like you this how- little byline at the end of the bio. It's like all this great stuff, and then at the very bottom there, it says Dr. Hariri has also produced several feature films and documentaries. As if all this <laughs> other stuff wasn't enough, but uh, it says, tell us about that. You know, in the spirit of full disclosure, I had to make sure everybody realized just how bad my attention deficit disorder was. <laughs> Look, you know, the bottom line is that I'm a guy who who's fascinated by lots of different things. When my oldest daughter was in her teens. Uh, she loved movies and was fascinated by the field. And to kind of show her what that industry was like, I got connected to some folks in the in the uh, in the Hollywood circle and got talked into being part of the production of a of a um, an independent film that got a lot of acclaim at Sundance. That bug sort of stuck with my family and I, and we did a couple of interesting things. But for me. The truth was I I realized how powerful a tool effective storytelling could be regardless of what your field of interest is. You know, I'll I'll give you an example. My oldest daughter is a passionate uh, World War II historian. Although she has a biology degree from Princeton and is a scientist in her chosen profession, her passion is history and specifically World War II history. So she has become an enormous fan of the history of that war being put on the on the big screen by Tom Hanks this band of brothers mm-hmm. uh series and i realized that you know that's how science 
should be disseminated to the public in those sorts of stories. Because I think that there's always an important human element. And for the lay audience, there's no better way to explain why someone devoted their life to you know, creating the first vaccine for polio than to, to put it in that kind of a, a human form. So that's how I got interested in it, and I've, I've played a little bit of a, a sideline role there. But um, all I can say oh, is – you had that, an appearance in one of your films? Oh, ab- absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, I, but I can tell you it, it's a fascinating field, uh, and the skills that these people have, I personally think that every time I get a young scientist in the laboratory, I, I try, and, try and develop their communication skills, and maybe I should send them to film school for a while. Yeah, I, I certainly I, I couldn't agree with you more. I believe in the power of storytelling, and in fact, I, I split my life in sort of a duality. Where on the on the one part, you know, I focus a lot on healthcare innovation and some of the work that I do, and of course, as being a physician. But on the other creative side of me, I think this notion of storytelling is an underutilized tool that essentially helps us get key messages and social causes and all sorts of causes across into the marketplace and something that I'm really focusing on with with the brand of unusual which is which has been a lot of fun. And it's how uh, you and I it's how you and I learned, right? I mean when we true. were, you know, training, we learned through case uh, studies. You know, medicine is an apprenticeship field, right? Where, you know, where our attendings and our senior and our senior docs are telling us about cases, and that's really how we pick up and learn um, and and develop our own our own sort of clinical intuition. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, great. So I think this is a great transition point. I ask of all of my guests. There's a series of rapid fire, Mad Lib like fill in the blank questions. There's six of them. So if you wouldn't mind, I would love to jump right into these and see what uh, you see what responses you give. Okay. All right. The first one is uh, the best piece of advice I ever received was. Oh, boy. Well, I can tell you that for me, there's a couple of important lessons I've learned from from individuals taking time to give me that advice. But the one that I take to heart is, if I'm the smartest person uh, in the room, I'm probably in the wrong room. <laughs> All right, great. Yeah, makes good sense. Love that one. Okay, next one. I'm most curious about... Uh, right now, I'm fascinated by the genetic basis of organogenesis. You know, what is it in our code that tells a single cell to start the process of building a complicated organ? I mean, you know, I talk about the software, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, just like when you put the install disk of Microsoft Office into your computer or you download the the execution file and it builds the the program in your uh, your your ROM and so on. I'm fascinated how the, how our biological software does that because I think if we understood that we could turn back on that organogenesis phenomena in any situation after we've excised a tumor, after we've removed a dead piece of heart muscle, etc. So I'm fascinated by that. Well, I can honestly say that I, I don't think anyone else that I've interviewed on this podcast has ever given that answer. Uh, so you're <laughs> definitely unique in that answer, uh, which is just fascinating uh, about you. All right, next one. If you had to write an autobiography about yourself, uh, the title of the book would be? <laughs> my Mission to Unlock My Inner Salamander. All right, explain. You got to explain that one. <laughs> so I've always been fascinated by the fact you can chop a salamander's arm off and, and regenerate. it grows back, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and I, but I'm convinced that that regenerative potential resides in everybody, and I want to figure out a way to unlock that. You know, I've seen some pretty fascinating stuff in my life, and you know, I'm convinced that resident in every individual is the ability to completely repair and regenerate something that is destroyed by disease or injury. I want to figure that out. I'm starting to see a very common thread in connecting the dots behind what you do, um, <laughs> which is great stuff. All right. Uh, next one. If if you could invite three people over for dinner, dead or alive, or it can even be an inanimate object, who would you invite and what would you talk about? Oh, man. these are These are really good questions. Well, I would definitely invite Robin Williams. I met him one time and he was absolutely brilliant, but the most entertaining human being I've ever been in the same room with. (laughs) So he'd have to come back. Hippocrates, because when I read his work and look at at how he's influenced our profession, Mm -hmm. 
he was just so incredibly logical and level-headed. Many of his quotes st- stick with me, but I, I, I would be fascinated to see what he was like in person. Probably not as funny as Robin Williams. <laughs> no, I doubt he would be. And is there a third? Yeah, like every other scientist, I'd love to. I'd love to have dinner with Einstein. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, probably because he and I uh, share the same uh, sense of fashion, <laughs> hairstyle, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I love those three. I love that combination there. Um, Great mix. All right. I've just got one more for you and then we'll wrap up here. So of course, on this podcast, we're all about celebrating what makes us unique and different. So how would you fill in the blank uh, for the following? I'm unusual because. You know, I've got to tell you that I spent a lot of time in the company of scientists and surgeons and physicians and so on. But I also spent a lot of time in the company of military people, you know, hardcore military people. Some of my best friends, uh, truly my best friends are are active duty Navy SEALs and things like that. And and I also spend time with, you know, leading iconic businessmen and all that. And, And what I think is what makes me fairly unique is the fact that I can, I'm comfortable in any of those environments. I can I can straddle some very discordant areas where if I put some of my friends in the same room together, they certainly wouldn't get along and not have a lot to talk about. You know, I have a pretty wide range of interests and my comfort zone is pretty wide. And I and I actually think that that is is a trait that is could be very useful to my colleagues in the sciences who sometimes become very insular and isolated. And, and that and that always concerns me. I completely agree. You got to keep one one foot in, one foot out. And I think that was really what drew me into some of your background, looking at all those sort of differences. But now I truly understand how those dots connect. Uh, Bob, it is such a delight speaking with you uh, today. I, I just feel so much smarter after this conversation. Thank you for being on the show. I'm sure everybody who's listening is probably going to be fascinated by this discussion. Before we wrap up, um, if anybody wanted to learn more about you, your work, anything else that you're working on, where where would you direct them to go? You know, um, if they go to my um, Twitter and look me up at Hariri Robert, H-A-R-I-R-I, R-O-B-E-R-T, or just, you know, look up Robert Hariri and connect with me there. Um, I try and keep things that are important to me up uh, in my most recent tweets. And I'm very open to connections. So if people have interest, they can feel free to contact me. Wonderful. Well, there you have it, folks. Bob, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a delight talking to you. And I will see you soon, hopefully, my friend. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Take care. Hi again, it's me, Dr. G. If you are still listening, I'm hoping it's because you enjoyed this podcast. If you would like to hear future episodes, you could really help me out by subscribing to the That's Unusual podcast on iTunes and leaving a review. It goes a long way in helping me get the word out from avid listeners like you. As a thank you, I will be selecting one new reviewer each week at random for a free private 15-minute phone conversation where you can ask me anything and get professional advice on your career or business to help you stand out and make a difference. Also, if you want to be notified of any future episodes, please visit thatsunusualpodcast.com and sign up to receive updates on new episode releases. Until next time, remember to always think unusual.